AM 1060 WMEL. The views expressed on the following program are those of the hosts, callers, and guests, and are not necessarily those of WMEL staff, management, or advertisers. This is Joe Stecker, folks, your host for Helping Seniors, the radio arm of Helping Seniors of Brevard.org. Helping Seniors is an organization that exists in order to complete the health care equation in Brevard County, and we do not compete with anyone. Our sole purpose is to act as a clearinghouse and an assembler of information so that you can be informed about the many wonderful resources that are available to assist all of us in Brevard County so that you're educated on what these services can do to help you. And in many cases, we can help you connect with these services. But most importantly, by talking to Kay Kaiser, the information specialist at 473-7770, you can talk to Kay. You can tell her what you think you need. Kay listens to what you're talking about. And we often find out that there are other needs that you have that you simply didn't know that you needed. What I'm talking about is, is kind of like going to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, uh, a primary care physician, a nurse, and she's not any of those people. But you know, I've learned through my life, you can gain an awful lot by talking over a problem with someone else. You know, I want to call it. You, you've, you've, you've given the medical profession to Kay, and frankly, she's much more valuable than that. She's a friend. Well, you're exactly <laughs> not right. one of those ists. She's a friend. Yeah, that's right. See, he preempts me, folks. I didn't even get a chance to go through my whole field. Oh, but my panelists today. I can't stand not talking. Hi, I'm Lee Sheldon. How you I, doing, everybody? I know, I know you're Lee Sheldon. But, folks, before you leave and I even get to talking today, and, and I think you know that Lee and I have been on the radio show together on his radio and his television show, and now my radio show and my television show for our organization's television show. It's not mine. But we've been doing this together since 1995. Five, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a long time, 20 years. Wow. 21 years. 21 years. But, folks, let me just mention our sponsors, then I'll introduce my panelists again. They, some of our sponsors include Kindred at Home um, Long-Term Care Hospital, the Eye Institute, Dr. Lee Sheldon, my panelist today, Bill Johnson, elder law attorney, this radio station, Wustoff Hospital uh, System, Levin Home Care, uh, Atlantic Shores Rehab, Ebony News Today, Riverview Senior Resort, 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 I gotta say that right, and Organized Creative Designs, an organization to help you downsize for you seniors that need to get rid of some of the clutter that you live with, me included. And one of our newest sponsors is Zon Beachside. It's a beautiful assisted living facility right down where Doubles is um, on South Patrick Drive, at almost the intersection of uh, South Patrick Drive and uh, what and uh, O'Galley Boulevard. It's the Mather, Mathers Bridge area, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's what, Lee? Yeah, it's, I was going to say it was right near Mathers Bridge, which is right, where, right. where, where yeah. Doubles is, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But, folks, it's a beautiful place. And let me tell you, just, 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 uh, I'll plug them just for a second. We had our uh, advocacy meeting of our advocacy council for the uh, organization there, and they hosted it last Monday. And and for for and for the lunch they they, they they treated us to lunch because I think because the uh, Greg Kennedy the director at Lee wanted us to see what kind of food they served and they served a delicious uh, a tossed green salad with uh, I think it was a vinaigrette type dressing I didn't try because I wasn't feeling well but then they also served a, a, a pasta with uh, chicken and uh, and it wasn't an Alfredo sauce but it also had artichokes it it was outstanding. And for dessert, they have it was like a cheesecake with white chocolate in the cheesecake itself, with the topping and I think it was a graham cracker crust. And my wife said she had saved a couple of bites for me. I just was just afraid to eat anything because my stomach was in too good a shape. But I, it's very difficult to sit there and watch people eat something that looks extremely good. Yeah, you agree with that? I totally do. Yeah, but folks today. Lee and I are going to talk about um, medications, and um, we've talked about it before, but we've never really titled a show something like this, Medications and What You Need to Know. And 
uh, Lee and I have talked about this over the years, and in his book, uh, A Solid Bite uh, a Dental Book, uh, he said... The Ultimate Mouth Manual. Yes, what? Remember, The Ultimate Mouth Manual is Ultimate our book, mouth. which is available to every listener right here. Why did I call Just it call Solid Bite? You called me Solid Bite again. Yeah, well, you are a Solid I Bite. I am a Solid well, Bite. <laughs> I've been a Solid Bite for a long time. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also another ist, but, the, but anyway. Yeah, um, yeah, we've got The Ultimate Mouth Manual, and I do talk about medications. The Ultimate Mouth Manual, um, you know, those of you who listen to this or listen to me on a regular basis wherever we are or Joe is or, or I am, uh, know that we've, we've written a book along with my son. And, and uh, yeah, just call our office, 259-8000, and you can get a copy of that book too. But, I, folks, I at least made a great offer to you because I can assure you that, you know, it's not right reading a, a new Clive Cussler book or a, a Webb Griffin book, <laughs> but... Uh, the stuff that Lee puts in there, and I like his, his artwork. It's sort of like hand-drawn artwork. I did it myself. Yeah, he's pointing to himself, folks. He did it himself. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's drawn in such a way, Lee, that the reader can understand what you're talking about. It's not a bunch of fancy things. You, you get right to the gritty of it, and that's exactly where everything you describe in a book, and you cover such a plethora of topics yeah. in a book. Yeah. It's interesting that um, I am now... Next month. In fact, I won't be able to make it to the show next month. I'm announcing it to you right now um, that uh, I'll be speaking in San Diego at the meeting of the American Academy of Periodontology. And we're going to be talking about some of the things that you and I are going to be talking about today. And it's the introduction of the wellness model into the periodontal practice. So they've asked me to speak to that. 20 years ago, Joe, even five years ago, nobody would have asked me to speak about the relationship between wellness and running a periodontal practice. But now that's what they've asked me to do because, of course, we do that. So uh, very, very exciting that the American Academy of Periodontology has asked me to do this. There are two others, two other periodontists in other parts of the country who are also going to be speaking. Um, very exciting that they are addressing that and moving in this direction. Well, you should be, Lee. I, I can understand your uh, your desire to do that because I, I, I know that in my own work of trying to expand programs in Burke County on how to uh, to um, do a better job of helping people or pulling together. And, you know, I think that's one of the hardest things is, it is for nonprofit organizations. And I told Lee said I had enough stuff here to talk about two shows. I said probably three if we don't digress. Already we're digressing. Yeah. But it's important for our listeners to know, Lee, I think why you and I both believe that uh, better knowledge about medications, better knowledge about what nonprofits can do, maybe they should know more about how these nonprofits and other organizations are funded so that they can make an intelligent decision on how they want to spend their dollars sure. to help people. Yep. It's extremely important because yep. just like you get excited about speaking to your 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 peers, I get excited when I had a woman send me an email and say, make sure you do this correctly so that our organization can help you promote your work in Brevard County, Joe. Nice. When, when people say that to me, that makes me very, very proud of, of all that our organization does to try to help people. And then I think the whole thing was uh, sort of cap ca ca this week when I had a call from a very, very well-known reporter, and I'm not going to say the name or anything until the story comes out. But they wanted to do a feature article on me, but the feature article is to be sort of centered about what I think some of the things we need to do for the future in Brevard County in order to meet the needs of an increasing number of senior citizens in our community. And the fact that they were asking me to do that, I feel the same way about doing that as you must feel about speaking to your fellow periodontists. That's true. Who, by the way, where's the article going to be? Where, where's it going to be published? It's going to be in the, the Vieira News and uh, Senior Life, good. and it'll be coming out in in September. And what's really good about this is that the Advocacy Council of the uh, Helping Seniors Organization has structured a new survey. And John Fredrickson, the publisher for Senior Scene Magazine, has devoted the front and back of an additional page, in addition to the nine pages we already get in the magazine, 
to the survey. And this survey, folks, is something that I, I will be promoting through uh, commercials here on this radio station. We'll be writing about it in the paper, and we'll be on our website. But the information on this, on this survey is something that will help set the stage for what we're able to tell the commissioners about what you, you, the listeners, the senior citizens, and those that care for seniors, what you think seniors need, not what somebody working in an organization, not even in Brevard County, thinks we need. It yep. should be about what we think we need. Really. Let me interview you for a second. You know, you've had enough experience around here, Joe, now for the past 20-plus years to know what's what's going on. Do you feel that there are biases away from seniors in, in Brevard County, that the biases are towards a group other than seniors or the seniors aren't being funded adequately? Lee, there's no doubt in my mind that the seniors are being funded, not being funded adequately because we have a, I can't tell you where I saw this statistic, but I, I've, I've known about it for years, but and this has been published by the state. The senior population is the second largest contributor to the economic uh, means of the state of Florida. Senior citizens, number two. If we're the number two, why is it that less than one tenth of one percent is even awarded to seniors in Brevard County through the nonprofit organization network? I'm talking just a little hasty, rapid mental calculation from United Way, state grants, and county or no, county grants, and United Way. Uh, the nonprofit organizations in Brevard County probably get uh, seven or $800,000, pretty close to that. Okay. That's, that, that's terrible. And the county now, the county itself, gives roughly $200,000 to senior organizations, roughly. Okay, roughly. and I'm assuming there's a lot more that are going to other organizations then. Oh, it's terrible. Okay. You know, and if, if the county doesn't have an aging home, if they don't provide any kind of services, if they don't do these things, does it sound like the seniors are getting a fair share of what they should be getting, especially since they're out of 545,000 people in Brevard County, 245,000 are over the age of 55. Right. There are, there are 22% of the population is over the age of 65, whereas only 18% are under the age of 18. Okay. So essentially there is a disparity. And you're right. I mean, listen, I work in an in, in elective environment. In other words, pe people see me because they want something, not because they have to get something. Yeah. yeah I mean, occasionally we have the toothache and that type of thing, but mostly people are seeing to me, seeing me, so they can chew better and they, so they can smile again, which is elective. I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it is elective. The people who see me are of the age that you're talking about, and so th that is the group that has the resources. That means that we are bigger pa taxpayers, and I'm not saying. Other groups shouldn't get the funding, but you're absolutely right. People of our age, and I'm 66 years old, people of our age have people, uh, there are other people of our age who don't have the means that I do. And while we're supporting, and I'm supporting Helping Seniors you know, in Brevard but... County, as well as a lot of other organizations, still, if we're relying upon the government to do that, it would make sense that people of my age should at least be contributing a little bit more to people of my age, and that county grants should be directed in that direction, or private grants should be directed more in the direction of, of seniors, because yeah, we need it too. The other thing when you're talking about elective... Um, the use of tax dollars uh, toward nonprofit organizations is, is, is quite a, a structured thing if you really follow what the state rules and laws and regulations are. Uh, we actually bypass that a lot. We don't follow what those things are. For instance, we say that uh, 
if it's a church-funded organization, they shouldn't be getting county funds. If yep. a church organization goes out and promotes a politician, they could lose their nonprofit status. That's right. The same thing applies to funding. Yep. So, you know, last comment on this, then we're, we are going to talk about medication. But I said the other day uh, to a, a person, and certainly in the know, and I said, if... These debates we had the other night where Mrs. Mayfield and uh, Rich Workman were accusing each other of doing this or doing that. I said, instead of just accusing and saying, I said, why didn't Florida Today just simply call Tallahassee and ask for the voting record? Because it's right there in black and white. Either one or the other did this or that. It is a fact. But the person replied to me, he said, Joe, if they did that, they wouldn't get all this dialogue going. Yeah, that's right. Entertainment. Yeah. Entertainment at the expense of people. And it bothers me, Lee, when people will call me and ask me for my opinion on who to vote for. I take that a very serious question for somebody to ask me. And um, I can only tell them when they ask me that how... I intend to vote and why I'm going to vote the way I do. And I just think that uh, in this day and age of information and education, we could do a heck of a lot better. Agreed? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this one. Medication. All right, so let's talk about medication because medication has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. Um, the basics that you know are that I people I feel, and I've written a chapter in the book, and I've written articles um in many places, that we are over-medicated here in Brevard County as well as the United States. That we rely on medications first, and we rely on diagnosis and cause second. And frankly, we should be looking, and I'm not even going to say diagnosis, because diagnosis can predispose you to needing a medication. We should be looking at cause first and understand what we are doing maybe bad, that we could be doing better, and that, and that there's an awful lot of self-correction that we can make. Yep. through diet, nutrition, exercise, however you want to look at it, in order to be able to avoid those medications. And I've demonstrated in my own practice. But you're a doctor, Lee. Yep. You have a medical background. Yep. And what you just said is, is extremely true, and it gets the back to the business of diagnosing and knowing how to treat what, what a diagnosis really is. Now, in my case, and in the case of many people in the United States, we have a common illness called fibromyalgia. Yes, but it's a non-diagnosed illness. Exactly Understand right. there's no way to diagnose it. It's a catch-all term and right. doesn't really mean anything other than a patient has chronic pain and we can't get to the bottom of it. Exactly. Right. So what they try to do is help that patient control the pain. Correct. But there are other ways in, in to address that before you ever get into that area of trying to control pain. Because just because you have a catch-all diagnosis, which means literally nothing, just because you have that, that could be the result of something else that you're not getting, something else that you're deficient in. And just because you've been put into the category, and I'm talking about you specifically, but there's so many people who are put in the category of fibromyalgia and then we dig deep down and we find out hey they're really not eating very well there's a whole lot of sugar that's going on here they really don't get any exercise all of these other things and i'm not saying that everybody's there but there are so many because i've seen it in my own practice that once they got their lifestyle straightened out oh all of a sudden fibromyalgia went away well uh, imagine what happened i agree a hundred percent but i happen to be one of those people that years ago was diagnosed with this darn thing yep and which we tried everything we can. And this whole thing was brought home to me uh, because I'm on a couple of pain medications and then they, uh, my doctor put me on a drug called Lyrica. We've stayed away from it for a long time. But uh, those of you that have followed me over the years know that I had a heart dissection and I had a stroke and uh, I had to be very careful about uh, blood thinners and uh, blood pressure and all this stuff. But water retention is one of the biggest uh, contributors to high blood pressure. So what I have, and it happened to me, was I started retaining a lot of fluid, and the doctors had me regularly you know, monitoring my blood pressure, had me doing all this stuff, and 
I simply wasn't controlling the water retention. So when I talked about my primary care doctor, he said, Joe, he said, Lyrica is one of the most strongest side effects of Lyrica is water retention. So he said, here, what I want you to do is go off of it. Folks, let me tell you, I highly recommend you follow what Dr. Shola is talking about. Read what medications can do to you. Do some research on the Internet because for three weeks I have gone through some pretty frightening times. I ended up in the emergency room. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, but it's the knowledge that what I was having is tantamount to a, like a withdrawal problem. It is, exactly. And there was a book written regar- with regard to that, and Lyrica is not specified in this, but you follow the same rules in this book for Lyrica and for any of the mi- medications that actually work in the psychotropic area, and Lyrica is one that has that. And the book is called The Antidepressant Solution. The Antidepressant Solution. You can find it on Amazon. And you'll be, it'll tell the story of four different patients who are being supervised by this doctor who wrote this book, The Antidepressant Solution, and how each of them had different ways of getting off the medication and tracked the withdrawal symptoms that were occurring as they were getting off them. There are some people that can get off some medications very, very quickly. And there's some, you know, we all have biological differences. I know, but... So there's some who need to get off things a lot more slowly. I've talked to you about my medications for years. That's right. And you know that I've never really had a problem like this with medication. This is the first time it ever happened to me. But once it happens to you, then you become a firm believer in trying to do what you can to help yourself understand what your problem is. That's right. And that's a sad statement for me to have to make because I am an educated person. I talk about this topic all the time. And so I am actually pleading with our listeners for them to do a better job of reading the paperwork that comes home with the drugs so they can understand how they can better address their own medical situation. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to add to that plea. I'm pleading to the doctors as well. Okay, folks, we're... Uh, we're going to hold it, hold it with these talk about the doctors. We'll pick it up on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Nominated Business of the Year by the Cocoa Beach Regional Chamber of Commerce. This is AM 1060 WMEL. This is Joe Stecker, folks, back live with the second half of the show. Uh, helping seniors are uh, the phone number for Kay at the office is 473-7770. Uh, sponsors for the second part of the show include Senior Scene Magazine, Hometown News, Spotlight Magazine, Tatler Bay, uh, or the Barefoot Bay Tatler Magazine. We're back. We're in there now in their newspaper. Seniors Helping Seniors, the Fountains of Melbourne, Courtney and Braswell Financial Team, Canadian Meds, uh, Melbourne Ear Care, Vitas Hospice, Aldea Today and Handy Pro of the Space Coast and Barbara McIntyre Home Equity Specialist. And folks, I just just a quick about you hear so many good things and bad things about home equity loans. I'll tell you there are good things, there are bad things. But the good thing is that if they're used correctly, they can help you. But save yourself a lot of time and grief by getting to the right person. I happen to believe, know and understand Barbara McIntyre, and the lady does a super job explaining how you can use these types of things to help you. And if you can use them to help you, why not do it? It makes, makes It's just like if you're going to take medications correctly, follow That's the right. instructions. That's right. Okay. And go to the right person. <laughs> All right. Lee, you were talking about, I was talking about people themselves understanding um, are doing a better job about getting our own information about drugs. And you were making to make a comment about uh, how doctors can improve what they do to help people. Yeah, that's right. Doctors learn a lot about putting patients on medications, but they learn very little on how to take patients off of medications. Um, and so you have to be a little bit more careful. If you've been taking a drug chronically for a long period of time, and a long period of time to me is probably more than two months or three months, something like that, 
<clears throat> then if you are told to go off that medication, you need to study up a little bit on how to go off that medication, um, because there can be there can be train um, there can be differences, and there are differences from person to person. Just as I mentioned before the break, the antidepressant solution talked about four different people getting off a certain type of drug, and the four different people had different experiences, and some were able to get off it real quickly, and other other people took a year to get off the medication. You know, shaving the pill down a little bit uh, at a time uh, over 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 several months so you've got to be careful you've got to know what uh what you can do to get off the medication because withdrawal from medication cannot it can sometimes not be very very easy at all but if you do it the right way you can minimize the side side effects and um, and feel very good that's that's one thing the other thing is that sometimes when you get off the medication you feel pretty crummy um and you have a recurrence of the symptoms that you thought were related to, and this is particularly the psychotropic drugs, um, that you're having symptoms that seem like you know, you're having a, psych- a, a, a psychological episode, if you will, or a psychiatric episode again, and when in fact that is a side effect of the drug. So you've got to be really careful to get off these medications. And if you're getting off these medications, and I'm not saying you should take them, if there's a way for you, for you to get off and get them off and get off them and have the withdrawal supervised, by all means do that, but make sure your supervision is really complete and do your own reading on the subject. Um, you know, whether you buy a book or just look on the internet and get some ideas, and I'm not saying the internet, the internet is always accurate, it's not, but go to some credible sources and read up on the medications that you're taking or the medications you're withdrawing from so that you can do the best for yourself in getting off these medications. Along with that, folks, I'll just tell you a sh- quick story because personal experience. Uh, I tried to get one of my prescriptions refilled uh, several day- oh, two weeks ago. And he said, oh, it's not time, Mr. Secretary, to get the uh, prescription refilled. I said, I don't have hardly any pills left in the bottle. Why isn't it? I've been a medication I've been taking for 10, 12, 10, 12 years. Yeah. And uh, didn't understand it. So I called over there this morning. And I said, I, I get the drug. I said, they told me I could get it on. Uh, it wasn't due to be refilled until the 1st of August. I said, it's now the 10th. And I said, hey, you're telling me I still can't get it. Why? And the man says, he says, I don't understand. He started reading this thing, and I looked at my prescription bottle, and it said, take one and a half pills twice a day. And there were 270 bucks. It was a three-month prescription. And, yeah, if that would have been a dosage, I would have been right. However, my doctor had increased the dosage to two pills twice a day, two pills in the morning, two pills a night. So I'm going to take four of them a day. Right. And uh, well, I'm certain. And then I called my doctor's office, and they still had a, do- a, a one and a half twice a day. So right now, they, the, the the nurse is taking it back to the cardiologist and saying, what is correct here? My point, folks, is you have to read the prescription dosage. You have to know what you're doing. And I'm putting myself in report. My wife knows I have not followed that advice myself, and I'm probably one of the world's worst about doing it. But it is taking me some harrowing experiences over the last three or four weeks to be willing to say to you, do a better job yourself so you don't end up like I did. That's right, and good. Thanks for setting the example for all of us. Well, the other thing is, Lee, is that when we talk about medications, uh, from a doctor's viewpoint, uh, Talk a little bit about the importance of telling all your doctors all the medications you're taking. Yeah, and not only that, but all the supplements you're taking as well. So so that we have a complete picture. You know we have a book of supplements and talk about supplements and their side effects. Particularly for me, where we do surgery, I'm very concerned about what medications people are taking, but also what supplements people are taking, because certain supplements taken, particularly in, in large quantity, can result in bleeding as episodes after surgery. So I need to know that so that I can supervise your withdrawal from that 
supplement as well as the medication. Yeah. Second thing, the second thing is this, and that is the drugs interact with other drugs. And sometimes we're taking three, four, five, six drugs. We don't have good documentation on how one drug works with five drugs. We only have information on how one drug works with one other drug. And so some of the things that we're looking for for documentation may not even be there. And so we have to look at you, and we have to look at you and, and, and understand what's going on with you so that, in fact, we're, make, we're helping you make the right decisions. Sometimes the doctor is going to prescribe a medication that might be good for 75% of the people, but for 25% it's not. And just because um, it, it says on the label that it's good for a particular, uh, a particular ailment or a particular disease, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for you for a particular disease. So you need to have good follow-up with your doctor um, and not just accept, oh, I'm feeling bad, and therefore, well, I need to wait a little while. You need to follow up with your doctor, make sure your doctor knows that you're feeling bad. So either the doctor makes the decision to keep you on the medication and perhaps reduces it or changes something about it or maybe tries a different medication. But how about in a case, what you're talking about now, really to cause an effect of uh, older people with reduced uh, 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 body mass and uh, reduced uh, uh, thinner people, uh, the, the effect of some of these drugs are multiple drugs on on people that just don't have the body weight that a, a, a younger person might have. Oh, it's true. It's I important. mean, you're right. And we are looking at body mass. When we're making, when we're prescribing medications, we are basing it on on weight to some degree. I mean, you know, and so if you lost a lot of weight or or if you've gained a lot of weight, then in fact that medication may not be as effective. But also, in particularly in the United States, we are working a lot on preventive medications. You and I have talked about that before as to whether they're worthwhile or not. But for example, if you're taking cholesterol-lowering medication in order to prevent a first heart attack, well, there's not a lot, lot of data for that. But let's assume you've been taking it from your since you were in your 60s and you're now well into your 80s. Is there really a reason for you to take it now? It doesn't mean that you just renew a prescription because you thought it was a good idea. There's more and more data, for example, on statin drugs now than there was 20 years ago. And it may be worth a discussion with the doctor to decide, hey, what's my chance of getting a, a first heart attack now that I'm 85? Do I really need to take this medication? What are the parameters by which we decide whether my cholesterol is okay or not? And if my cholesterol goes up a little bit, is that going to be, is that still a reason to take the medication? Because a cholesterol-lowering medication can have other effects. They can have nervous effects or nerve-ending uh, nerve effects. So you get soreness, muscle cramps, uh, anxiety, those types of things by taking those drugs. So when, and, and, and the first, first thing that we might say is, oh, I've got an anxiety attack. Well, I need to take an anti-anxiety medication when, in fact, it's the cholesterol-lowering medication that reduces the amount of, uh, of, of the coating on each of the nerves, and that, in fact, is producing the, the, the anxiety itself. So you've really got to look at what these medications are doing and take as few as you can, rather as many, uh, as, many as, as you can. Another thing I would like you to comment on is uh, what, what uh, I, I, the terminology I, I heard for it was called chasing your blood pressure. Uh, you know, people come, become obsessed if... if uh, with uh, taking blood pressure, and if you take it uh, a half a dozen times a day, and each time you start worrying about it more, it's going to tend to to build to, uh, to increase that blood pressure because their stress and anxiety levels have increased and elevated. But at the same time, if you got high blood pressure, you want to know what you need to do. It's true. And uh, what's the cause and effect there? Well, it's interesting because I will a patient will come into my office. And this happens multiple times. Uh, patients will come into our offices, into a doctor's office, and, you know, it's called white coat syndrome. You've all heard of that. You come in the doctor's office, your blood pressure goes up. Well, does that mean that you need blood pressure medication? Well, probably not. You know, it's probably as good an idea to get your blood pressure taken at a neutral place fire station, you can put your arm in those machines at, at drug stores or, or supermarkets and, and check your blood pressure in other places because just because you're in a strength, stressful situation like my, you know, like my office, although we try to make it as stress-free as possible, doesn't necessarily mean you're encountering those stress-filled 
situations in everyday life, and therefore your need for medication may not be as great as you might think it is. It's a particular problem for us because when people walk into our offices um, and their blood pressure is up, well, I start injecting medications when I'm getting them numb, and that has epinephrine in it, and epinephrine makes your blood pressure go higher. And so when those patients come in and their blood pressure is elevated, well, I don't want to elevate it even more with the medications that I'm injecting so that sometimes I'm going to use other medications to bring it down, whether it's blood pressure medication or whether it's some kind of a temporary anti-anxiety medication to relax them. We're going to do something to bring their blood pressure down so they can withstand the, uh, the, uh, the injection for the procedure itself. The other thing is, uh, I think, personally think, is the, uh, that a big thing uh, that causes a problem is the macho male image. <laughs> where, uh, where, where's, where's the macho male? Give me some more testosterone, will you? <laughs> <laughs> where, where, first of all, we don't want to be honest with our doctors and tell them that uh, we're taking all these medications because they think that the doctor might have a lesser opinion of us because uh, we're on so many drugs. Uh, <laughs> You know, it goes back again. Honesty with a doctor. I can't. If, if you're Catholic and you're going to go for a rec- sacrament of reconciliation, you got to be honest with the priest. That's right. If you're going to a doctor and you're talking about your health, you've got to be honest with the doctor. And if a doctor says, "Have you? Uh, do you wash your urine in the toilet?" He said, "Have you noticed any blood or something?" The guy, I said, I, I just saw a little bit, but I'm not going to tell him. Right. That's stupid. Yeah, it is. Because all these things are indicators of potential problems and they need to be examined and some of which can be fixed you know that you can you can fix these problems you see urine in the toilet i mean you see blood in the toilet you can do something about that i just uh, had my uh, <laughs> my examination earlier today <laughs> just said I spent an hour with my doctor just before i came over here so, so uh, I, and she made me be very honest with her. So I was. And then when I, if, if she ran enough blood tests, so even if I were lying to her, she knew I was lying to her. Oh, gee. <laughs> well, you know, we can laugh about it and we can joke about it, but we all can do a better job of educating ourselves because there are very, very few people that don't have a computer at home. And if you got a question about something, you can just, if you want to ask a question at a computer, you can put a question in one way, and if you don't get to answer it, you can just about try a second way and get a, and get a lead on where to go. And you may not like what you, what you, what you read, but you are, you are absolutely correctly, uh, problems once they're identified, have a better chance of being corrected than if we don't know about them. But having said that, uh, the American people are probably some of the worst in the world about eating things that could ultimately cause some of the problems that we're talking about. We uh, uh, Terry was looking up on the Internet, and she says, you know, almost every illness, everything we got smoking can be a, a, a cause of almost everything or a contributing factor to a, uh, a reduced situation and almost anything we see. And uh, so many people, they just continue to smoke. Oh, look at sugar as well. But sugar. I, I want to go back one step because there's okay. one source that I want to make sure that we all know about. Okay. There is somebody that you see when you go to the drugstore, or you can see when you go to the drugstore, who has six years of pharmaceutical education before he or she is allowed to dispense medications to you. And you know where there's play, that place in the in, in the pharmacy where you can speak with the pharmacist. Pharmacists are very, very knowledgeable about medications, and they can tell you a lot more about the medications than doctors can because they, you know, doctors, we're, we're here to to study diseases of the body and healing the body. They are there solely to learn and to discuss and to learn the effects of medications. They're a great resource, and it's free. I, and, and to just echo that, I had, it wasn't too long ago, I was I turned a prescription, and, and we got a call at home. The pharmacist had called to ask what other medications I was taking because he was concerned about me taking this medication based on what he knew about my condition. Good for that so, pharmacist. Wow, know, yeah. what a service. Yeah. 
So, but you're right, Lee. They, uh, the pharmacist is an extremely good resource for all of us to use. Yeah, and and of course the pharmacists are there, and when when the pharmacy is open, the pharmacist has to be there. And so when you're picking up your medications, unless you're getting me- your medications by mail or they're being delivered, you have every opportunity to talk to the pharmacist. And frankly, you can make a phone call just uh, and, and talk to the pharmacist, um, you know, from home. There there is no problem in doing that. I do that as well. There are times when I'll call the pharmacist to find out about a medication that I'm prescribing that may interact with other medications, and I want the pharmacist point of view because just because I can read it in the books that I have doesn't mean that I have all the information the pharmacist has some great information as well and so so uh, so we use that and we we use resources there are a lot of resources we can use um, I have patients who's, who's who's a diabetic and who has is on several medications and I saw some sores in the mouth that bothered me and they were they were, they were giving her some discomfort and frankly there were sores and I just wasn't sure I wasn't sure what to do with them, and so I took pictures of those sores, and I sent an email up to one of the oral pathologists at the University of Florida, and I said, take a look at these. Here's her history. Give me some ideas. He was back to me within 24 hours saying, here's what I would do. So even we doctors have doctors that we, we rely on for advice uh, as well. That's a, that's a great that's, a, that's, that's, that's saying an awful lot there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know, let's go back to what I said. I talked about the question I had here. I said, let's talk a little bit about items, especially important to seniors. Okay. And I listed five things. I said diet, yeah. water usage, exercise, reducing stress, and the importance of good dental hygiene. And you said a comment in a very first part of this of this of the show, and we were talking about. We have learned so much over the last 20 years about what good dental hygiene can do to improve overall body health. Yeah. Yeah, and we've we've got so many. Every time you study periodontal disease and its effect or its relationship to any other disease on the body, every time they study that other disease, we're finding a relationship between periodontal disease and that. So certainly we've got, you know, you've... The mouth is a great portal of entry for any foreign object that goes down your throat or goes between your gums and your teeth. And those infections can, can spread can spread through, throughout your body and can cause rather devastating effects. So if you're not getting your periodontal health under control, then chances are for at least some people and probably more than some people, it can be uh, affecting your overall health as well. Books, if you thought about, about what Lee and I are talking about today is important, you know, by tomorrow night, if all goes well, this show will be archived on helping seniors of Bavard.org. So if you are talking to a friend and you say you should, have, you should have been able to hear what Lee and Joe were talking about because I think it might be something of good information for you, all you have to do is tell them to go to the website. They can pull, pull it up on the website and listen to the whole darn show. That's right. It, this is so importantly is all the stuff we're doing is as we're talking to people and one I want to get a plug in for something before time runs out folks we're raffling off a uh, 1992 XJS V12 Jaguar got 38,000 miles on it's a beautiful car you can get tickets by for it for a $25 donation per ticket you can you can get these through uh, call K at the office 473-7770 or go on our website and we now are able to order the tickets on the website but uh, I didn't want the show to go through today because frankly I'll tell you honestly we need your financial help to make this program work it's not something that happens ipso facto done deal you got to work at it yep it's just like if you want to have good health, you got to work at having good health. <laughs> you got to work. If you want to lose 20 pounds, you got to stop eating so much sugar, it's... and you got to do a better job of what, how much you put in. Not only what you put in, but the amount that you put in late. Absolutely right. I mean, we have, you know, it's funny. Our regulating mechanisms sometimes work better when we're kids, but also our regulating me- mechanisms work when we have food that's actually going into our bodies. And you've heard me say it before. You've heard me see it, say it here and every place else. If it's in a can or a box, it's not food anymore. 
Oh, it may look like food, but it's been processed so much that the body doesn't recognize it as food, and therefore you'll crave it. When I, you know, when I, when I, when I really feel like a glutton, and when I keep eating and eating and eating, and yeah, it happens to me too. If I just take take an apple, and by the way, for me it's an organic apple, and I think organic apples are really important. Um, but I will cut up an apple, I'll eat the apple, and then my craving goes away. Apple. Ugh. I'm only kidding. He might leave his hand. But, Lee, if I... I've got a trivia question on apples. Okay, I, we'll save it for the next show. <laughs> I, I want your approval on this. What's you, that? I want your opinion on this. Yeah. Beef or Brady's on Tuesday night has a taco night. Yes. And their tacos are filled with lettuce. <laughs> lettuce, that's not a vegetable. I know, but they have lettuce and yeah. they have a sauce and they have chicken and, and cheese and those things. And then you get a big side of fresh steamed broccoli. <laughs> Good. Now, if you're gonna go Ditch out, the taco and have the broccoli. <laughs> it's not too bad, though, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't done a nutritional analysis, but trust right. me on this one. Ditch the taco. You, take you, the broccoli. You, you, can, you can take Elmer out for a big night out and take her over for, for a taco. Ed, please I'll tell her you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, you know, it's fun to do something with somebody that has the same enthusiasm about getting good information out to people. Lee, you've got uh, 12 seconds. Your last, you close it out. <laughs> it's been great, and I'll see you in October. Okay. All right. Thank you, folks. And remember, the phone number for K is 473-7770. 473-7770. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye.